Hello there, I'm Kate Dimbleby from Stornoway and this is the CMC Perspective on new trends for kids in interactive content. We're in the middle of an enormous shift in the way that we interact with TV and video. Netflix and YouTube's success is partly built upon the way that when one video ends, they prompt you to watch another and another. We used to lean back, now we lean forward. And this has opened the door to a whole new type of content for the 2020s. Maybe we need to break out of the confines of the old school TV paradigms and explore new territory. What's that mean? No idea, but I'm thinking interactive TV, where you get to decide what happens in the story. Yeah, it sounds fun. Uh These are programs in all genres, not just drama, but comedy, factual, children's and animation, where the viewer gets to choose a path through the show, see different perspectives, watch and replay. The best-known example of this so far is the huge hit that Netflix had last year with their Black Mirror interactive show Bandersnatch, which won the Emmy for Outstanding Television Movie, heralding Interactive's arrival into the mainstream. Netflix are continuing to develop and release interactive shows. Most so far have been companions for their children's brands in factual entertainment and animation, with more on the way. Now the other platforms and broadcasters are looking at how they can do this too. In this perspective piece, we talk to eight writers and producers and heads of Interactive, some of whom have been telling interactive stories in different forms for a long time now, some of whom are new to Interactive and developing ideas for streaming platforms. To find out what it is, why it's happening now, why they think it has such appeal and potential for engagement, learning and creativity, how they're going about making it, and what they think the future looks like. Ian Livingston has been a leading light in the tabletop and video games industry for decades. He co-created the incredibly successful fighting fantasy game books in the 1980s, which were the first branching narrative books with an inbuilt game system. Charlie Brooker cited Ian's books as an inspiration for Bandersnatch, and he's invested in interactive film company Flavorworks. He's been thinking about this type of convergence of stories and games for a long time. Uh, fighting fantasy game books in the 1980s, you know, they sold over 20 million copies because moving from that passive experience to interactive experience was very empowering. And giving a person agency is very rewarding. And they talk about their experiences as though it was their, them being there. So I think uh, for today's children who've been brought up uh, as effectively as digital na- natives, they interact with everything and they share everything. I think this is a, a new medium that appeals to them instinctively and they quite uh, enjoy interactive experience more than they do uh, a passive experience. Tim Wright is a writer and producer who's been working with interactive stories since 1994 and teaches at the National Film and Television School where he's been the acting head of Immersive. He also won the only BAFTA for interactive comedy. Whenever I say I work on interactive storytelling, they go, oh, is that that thing where you get to decide the ending? They say, that's, that's what everybody thinks it is, right? And you go, well, sort of. But, um, um, but how unsatisfying those things are, particularly for drama and character-based storytelling, is you don't, you don't want your character to have the capacity to do anything you tell it. Otherwise, it lacks psychological sort of integrity and independence as a character. I really like the Minecraft story mode because you get to choose which paths the characters go on and what plot line you want to choose. And also you get to see which personality you want to have for your character. So unlike a game, you can choose what your character thinks and feels. um, And it's more like a TV show. Amy Grossberg is series producer of interactive content for Nine Story Media Group. Previously, she worked at Nickelodeon, where she built the first interactive department and oversaw production of interactive experiences, including Blues, Clues and You, which has been nominated this year for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Interactive Media for a Daytime Programme. For most kids' content games, while they have a goal, they really don't have a new story that's being introduced. It often supports an an existing story, um, yet they're fully interactive. And regular TV, um, you know, they're while there might be some uh, interactivity throughout through call and response moments, um, it's not truly interactive. And so with interactive shows, it has the ability to kind of combine the best of both. Danielle Ifagan is the executive creative director at Ardman for all the interactive work they do. Yeah, it can seem, it can either seem very limited if you're coming off the back of kind of gaming um, or seem like a a massive expanse if you're kind of coming from linear um, in terms of that interactivity. But what I I adore about it is its purity. Um, I think it gives us a chance to 
to look at narrative and interactive narrative as an as an art form um which doesn't make it not part of gaming and doesn't make it not part of filmmaking but i do think there is there is something independent about it about that kind of form like a progression of storytelling and that's what i love about it so what's special about this particular moment why is it happening now Alex Breen is Vice President of Interactive at Nine Story Media Group. He's based in New York and he oversees the production and distribution of all of their interactive content. Well, I think it's a good time for a number of reasons, in particular because of how accessible content is now um, and the multiple platforms it's available on. So, for example, when Netflix launches a title, like an interactive title, it's worldwide across TV, web, mobile, and game consoles. So there's just such a huge reach and availability to people. So I'd say three basic sort of progressions technologically have changed things. And they're all the constraints that we were bat- we've been battling with over the years. So one is basic bandwidth and speed. Uh, the second thing is just your available memory in the device that you've got. And then um, the last thing is this business of you can make your content once and it will work relatively well on a range of platforms. That convergence of those three things to make something much more sort of accessible and seamless and fast is a really, really big deal. So I think that combined with the younger audience where if you think about them, they're really like a generation of media makers and they have multiple technologies at their fingertips that they're constantly adopting and setting trends for everybody else. So I feel like it's only natural now that kids would crave this level of agency and storytelling and like connecting to a narrative and characters in a more personal way. Well, television, you sort of just like sit back the whole time. You don't like do much. You just sort of like watch. You don't do anything at all. And um, whereas with this, you sit up and you're sort of like sitting up and like your brain's thinking about what it's going to do it's a bit like um it's a bit like like a it's a bit like a riddle emma earl is co-artistic director of innovative children's theater and media company pins and needles productions which recently won arts council covid funding to make select a quest turning an immersive theater show into an interactive film for children in just 72 hours with a branching narrative featuring 27 scenes and characters lots of nasty deaths and one ending. I asked my six-year-old who, upon first playing the game, was totally freaked out because it, for her, was the first experience she'd had of the responsibility of making a choice that would affect narrative. Inevitably, she came back to the game. She said she wanted to do it again. And suddenly, she has just been completely hooked on the choice mechanic. I enjoy the fact that I get to pick where I go because it's like that it's your game to play. Yeah, I think uh, today's kids are watching video and interacting with their favorite characters on a whole new set of devices. And in in the US, uh, especially the majority of preschoolers have access to um, and use multiple devices. And we're seeing that many of them even own their own tablet. So They have access to video on demand, you know, for their whole life. So they're incredibly adaptable to technology and expect to be able to play anything that they see on screen. Some of the things we've heard here, hooked on the choice mechanic, kids being in control, more screen time playing games, are not always the things that are music to parents' ears. So what does this all mean? Should we welcome this? Matt Brandon is a series producer showrunner for Plimsoll Productions. Hugely experienced in linear production and storytelling, he's now developing his first interactive factual production for children. They are incredibly sophisticated children. They're incredibly sophisticated. The way that they view television, that they can look at certain bits of TV or sequences and unpick them. Sometimes when they're made by adults, they don't really understand kids. They always think they're either like, not clever enough. I mean, the ones that are made for younger kids are always great, but then the ones made for older kids, sometimes they do things that basically show that they think that that some sometimes they underestimate. They think kids are really thick. Basically that. 
they want to learn, but they don't want to know that they're learning. They just, it's the same way that we watch a documentary. It's just, it, it, it needs to be fed in because it's intelligent television or content. The Final Fantasy game books are, are exactly that. They're part game, part book. And while society usually says wonderful things about books, it hasn't always said wonderful things about games. And when the Final Fantasy game books were released, um, they resonated with children for the reason I just said. And they were later found to be really good uh, in, in multiple ways for improving literacy, for critical thinking, for algorithmic thinking, problem solving, not being punished for making a mistake, and they were able to fail and start again. These kind of gave children kind of confidence and, uh, and empowerment that you don't have in a traditional linear experience. But I do think that your brain changes gear when you are being actively, actively engaging and making choice versus sitting back and being passive. Usually when I'm watching TV, I watch TV and then I get up and I feel like I need to do something because it's, I've just been sitting and I'm not really feeling tired. Whereas I had to think about the choices and I had to like, 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 you know. So I actually felt tired after doing it. What's amazing watching both Phoenix and Zane um, watch the films is the, is the, act, the visceral reaction that they had to having some control over what might, what, what might happen. What, and, and it was not necessarily when they got to make the choices, it was leading up to it. They were taking, they, they, they absolutely consumed every little bit of information that we put in there so that they were then armed with the knowledge that they needed to make the choice. So this interactivity is the perfect, perfect way to engage them. The differences with a game and a TV show um, compared to this is that unlike a game, and unlike a TV show, you don't have a right and a wrong way of doing things. It's all interconnected. So whichever path you go on, it's a different story rather than right or wrong. You can choose different paths to go on to take the characters on different journeys. It's not like an exam, which is a binary. A, yes, you got it right, you're able. B, you got it wrong, you're less able. So our games, for me, gives people multiple skills, meta skills and confidence levels and problem solving whilst they're actually enjoying themselves. So why not have fun when you're learning? For those used to working with linear stories, what does the process of developing a non-linear narrative look like? I had no idea what interactive was um, or what it means or, or how you could go about it. It's um, a scary prospect because we all like sitting in our comfort zone and to try and do something different is the one hand really exciting it's why we are in this whole creative business why, why some of us are in it i suppose a lot of the storytelling that we're involved in in theaters um is sort of inherently interactive whether that's you know bringing a giant puppet in amongst the audience or letting it snow on the audience or recruiting an audience member to play a part in a story so I'm very interested in that relationship um, and how, how that can make the, the viewer, the participant, the watcher feel um, engaged in a different way. Rachel Drummond Hay is one of the two owners of Drummer TV who have won two BAFTAs for their factual programming for children and who are developing interactive ideas for some of their children's unscripted titles, including Gym Stars, thinking about using interactivity to allow more personalised viewer journeys. Now, with our audiences, they're so kind of, um, you know, they like to watch and repeat and repeat and repeat things. Um, they get very drawn into particular kind of characters or, you know, some might just want to watch with gym stars. You know, they might just want to watch kind of amazing gymnastics moves. Um, the boys might just want to watch the boys or the girls might just want to watch their specific type of gymnastic um, discipline. So I think it's about giving viewers the choice of how they engage with a programme. I really like the fact that you can watch and replay, which means you can choose different paths each time you watch it and play it. And so you can show your friends and then play it again and again and again and have different outcomes for each time. So what practically do you need to get started? 
Things have moved on even in the last couple of years since Charlie Brooker complained that the lack of writing and production software sent everyone making Bandersnatch a bit bananas. Netflix have developed their own in-house programme, Branch Manager, and there are others available for everybody else. Our production tool, Stornoway, the open source Twine, Echo and others are available. Where should you start if you're a regular writer or producer and not a game developer? Well, today there's software available, Twine and, and other proprietary um technologies that allow branching narrative to be created and and done a lot easier for for the for the authors we did it from you know in, in the steam age and so i used to write my books with old-fashioned fountain pen on a pad of paper so it was it's actually a nightmare doing it back in those days but it was very very rewarding 10 years ago rachel drummond hay made an interactive film for the nhs when it came to the edit, it, it was easy to make the clips, but kind of putting it all together and packaging it became an absolute nightmare for us. And I think the things that were so hard for me 10, 15 years ago, and almost kind of put us off ever doing anything like that again, actually now you can kind of just like literally just kind of drag and drop and just plop different bits of programming and then sort of very quickly see how that would play out as a kind of linear structure. What made it easy is that we had initially thought that this was an impossible jigsaw to put together, but in fact it was just, we just edited in a normal linear way a number of different stories, put them into their own slot as it were, and then it plays out and you can manage, you can manage your story, you can see exactly where you're going. So it was a really interesting process and actually Jack and I, Jack, Jack the editor and I, really enjoyed it. So he got to put all the bits in, I just get to view it and got my kids in to have a look at it and they were fascinated. We had looked at sort of story maps for similar sort of uh, experiences, be it um, the old Choose Your Own Adventure books or um, sort of text adventures from the 80s that I loved, you know, growing up. Um, and, and looking at how we could have a branching narrative um, with several levels of progression but not allow the game to spiral too far. We looked at options of doing it through YouTube but then we were really worried about adverts and, and such like and so being able to partner up with Stornoway was just a massive gift because it was a very simple, um, intuitive way to, to make the work um, function and we have successfully published it across phones tablets laptops um and and it and it works and it went through like the most rapid testing phase imaginable because it all had to be done within 72 hours why hello there little chicky come in take a load off uh, do you like what i've done with the place so where is it happening now and what does the future hold the good thing about what netflix is doing is they're releasing a variety of titles and yeah. other people need to start doing that and then people will notice it more. I think, you know, I think Netflix have done great pioneering, pushing, um, giving us a really viable option to create this work. And I really hope they continue to have great success with it because it's a beacon. Um, but yeah, I do think there's some really blurry and exciting spaces forming that will allow this kind of stuff to happen. I think Google Stadia, for example, is a is a great example and there's similar rumblings you know with what um, Amazon are up to with Twitch and so I feel like this kind of blurrier spaces to allow you to experience to sit back and experience play a, uh, a piece of video but in an interactive way will just continue to increase so yeah I'm quite excited for that. This is really just the beginning of interactivity um, in the way that, you know, we're exploring it now because, again, we can, there's more devices out there. There's more creators who are curious. I think, you know, just thinking about how things could evolve, you know, with horror and um, drama and theater, I think that there's just still so much potential out there. Finally, we asked everyone if they had any useful advice for writers and producers wanting to get started. I think people feel it's a really high bar to get into interactive stuff because you, you, you've got to sort of learn how to program or at least not be sniggered at by people who do program. But I think that's completely the wrong approach. I think you've just got to uh, go out there with whatever skills or tools you've got and just try it 
there's a, you know, a lot of test work that needs to be done and you need to be building that into your process. It's not just taking a regular linear schedule, duplicating it and, and making that for interactive. You need to leave beats and opportunities for exploration and discovery. The most important thing I would say when writing a branching narrative on whatever medium it is, is that choice has to have real consequence. Otherwise it's pointless. I mean, I've seen some offerings where it doesn't matter if you choose A or B, you end up at the same point. So people think, oh, that's pretty boring but they're actually missing the point. It has to have consequence of your actions. Well, I think it would have been improved if you could, like, um, the, if the things, if the choices you made affected the story more, because um, say you chose, say you chose to make um, find true love for him or you chose to make him laugh, then um, they sort of both ended up in the same place so they didn't really affect the story much so i think a way to improve it would be to like make it affect the story more because that would be really fun to like if you do this you fail if you do this you succeed um i think the best creative outputs which is why i I believe things like bandersnatch have kind of shone um through uh relate to each other obviously linearly so your experience um at the end is related to the experience at the beginning but also what's what's that way across it so if you make if you play it once and you have one choice and you play it again and you go for another choice those both relate to each other as well it was a a constant learning curve and a really fun one to go on um and something that i hope to do more and more again so yeah my advice would be absolutely kind of roll your sleeves up and jump in and and have a go at it have a play it feels like playing a game it's really fun hey What do you say we head back to camp? Why, it's just through that clearing. Won't take but a minute. See, first, won't you have a little boogie with old Melvis? Because you're the winner, baby. That's right, yeah. You're the winner. Come on, now let's boogie. Thank you so much for watching. Details for everyone you've heard from are on the CMC website and will include links to the tools and interactive shows they mentioned. Please get in touch and get involved via the CMC platform. We'd love to hear your questions and your own perspectives on this. Thanks again to all of the panel, to Greg Childs for suggesting this, to my co-producer Rupert Howe from Stornoway for editing, and our CMC executive producer, Alison Norrington, whose voice is sadly missing from this piece, but she's a great person to talk to about it as she's the founder and creative director of the transmedia studio Story Central. 